we now turn our attention to the labor market. To make the same observation as we did for capital. In recessions, we don't see full employment, just people making less money per hour. We do see fluctuations in the number of employed people. This section is inspired by the contributions of Peter Diamond, Dale Mortensen, and Christopher Pissaridis, who were awarded the Nobel Prize for their analysis of markets with search frictions. Before diving more into the details of their ideas, note that at any given moment in time, there are flows of people into and out of employment. In this example, the stock of employed people, which is typically larger, is represented by the box L. The, st the stock of unemployed by the smaller box U. We have that 3% of all employed people lose or quit their jobs every month, and that 50% of unemployed people find a job every month. This means that at any moment in time, there is always a number of unemployed people who are transitioning between jobs. This is at the core of the search frictions analyzed by Diamond, Mortensen, and Pissaridis. The idea that people get separated from jobs and take time until they find a new one. Let's also lay down some definitions that will help us to deepen our analysis. Let sigma be the rate at which job matches dissolve. Typically, this rate is high among inexperienced workers who are hard to evaluate or among young persons who are likely to experience changes in family size or job preferences. The separation rate is also high in industries that are subject to frequent shocks to technology or product demand. Let phi be the job finding rate, the rate at which new worker firm matches are successful. What would be the natural rate of unemployment, UN, that is the unemployment rate to which the economy tends towards, given the rates at which people lose and find jobs? Note that the change in number of people employed over a month, delta L, is given by the job finding rate times the number of unemployed minus the job separation rate times the number of employed people. Or in other words, the difference between job findings and job separations. In the long run, we assume that the levels of employment and unemployment are constant. This means that delta L is zero and consequently, the number of job findings must equate the number of job separations. Let the labor force LF be constant and equal to employment L plus unemployment U. Then employment is equal to the labor force minus employment. Substitute in the equation above to get that the number of job findings, phi U, is equal to the separation rate times LF minus U. Solve with respect to unemployment over the labor force, the natural rate, and get that this is equal to sigma over phi plus sigma. Note that the labor force, as we can see in the graph here, tends not to move with the economic cycle. The correlation with output for the period of 1999 to 2015 in the Eurozone was found to be very small and in fact close to zero. Historically, we have been seeing a decrease in the natural rate of unemployment since the 1980s. This is consistent with improvements in communication, technologies, and the internet that facilitated job search. Remember that the natural rate is equal to the job separation rate over the sum of the separation and job findings rate. As the job finding rate increases, so will decrease the natural rate of unemployment. What seems to be very procyclical is precisely the level of employment. As we can see here for the Eurozone between 1999 and 2015, the equilibrium business cycle model is probably satisfactory for understanding fluctuations in hours worked per worker. The real wage rate adjusts to equate the quantities of labor supplied to the quantity demanded. However, this approach leaves unexplained the most important factor, the fluctuations in the employment rate, or equivalently, in the unemployment rate. Accordingly, 
we introduce a model of job finding. Assume that at any point in time, a worker receives a distribution of wage offers. For each real wage rate, W over P, on the horizontal axis, that is the value with the probability of receiving that wage offer on the vertical axis. Now, the value omega is the effective real income received while unemployed. So the key decision is whether to accept or not a real wage when it is greater than omega. Let W over P be the reservation wage, the level of the wage offer above which the worker accepts any offer. As a consequence, we have in the shaded blue area the share of workers that every period will find a job. If omega increases, think of the value of the unemployment subsidy, for example, it is also likely that the reservation wage will increase accordingly. Think of it in terms of the amount that you would require in addition to the unemployment subsidy that can result from the effort needed, expenses with going to work, etc. If that happens, then job offers will be rejected more often and the rise in omega will raise the expected duration of unemployment. That is, the amount of time that the typical unemployed person stays unemployed. Assume now that there is a positive TFP shock. This will increase the demand for labor at a given wage, which in practice implies that the distribution of wage offers will move to the right. This will result in an increase of the number of offers that are now accepted, and the duration of unemployment will decrease, resulting in an increase in employment, just as we saw in the data. If the opposite is true, say a negative TFP shock that drove the economy into a recession, the distribution of wage offers moves to the left, resulting now in a smaller probability of receiving offers that the worker will accept, raising the duration of unemployment and reducing total employment. Search by firms is also important in a well-functioning labor market. Allowing for this search does not change our major conclusions, though. It still takes time for workers to match with jobs so that the expected durations of unemployment and vacancies are greater than zero. An increase in the technology level A raises the prospective marginal product of labor. For a given real wage rate, W over P, firms post now more job openings. Therefore, job vacancies increase. An unfavorable shock reduces vacancies. Thus, our prediction is that vacancies are pro-cyclical, high in booms and low in recessions. This is a prediction that is also confirmed by the data. As you can see in this figure, job vacancies are very pro-cyclical. Fluctuations in unemployment could, in theory, come not from people finding more jobs in booms and finding less jobs in recessions, but from more people being fired in recessions and less in expansions. However, as we can see in this figure, that is not the case. Data on job separation rates don't seem to have a significant co-movement with unemployment. However, job finding rate has a very strong and negative correlation with unemployment. This is further validation of our proposed extension to the equilibrium business cycle model. Indeed, fluctuations in unemployment seem to come much more from being much harder to find a job in a recession than from increased risk of being fired. You have to take into account that job separation can happen for two reasons. For people being fired, but also from people quitting. And if you believe that it is harder to find a job in a recession, people will quit less. The increase in the probability of being fired could be compensated by the decrease in the willingness to quit, leading to a very weak correlation of the job separation rate and unemployment, leaving the job search and job finding rates as the relevant dynamics of fluctuations in unemployment.